Good evening. I am Terry Rhodes, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Abbey Speaker Series event, The Future of Conservatism. The Abbey Speaker Series is hosted by UNC's Program for Public Discourse, which seeks to build our students' capacities for debate and deliberation, and to foster a culture of constructive dialogue about issues of national and international importance. Given that many Americans describe themselves as conservative, the future of conservatism is certainly an issue of national importance. Moreover, the conservatism movement in America is not and has never been monolithic. Tonight's panel will explore both areas of consensus and areas of disagreement within American conservatism. The Program for Public Discourse has partnered with the Arete Initiative at Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics to plan tonight's event. The Arete Initiative encourages the cultivation of intellectual and civic virtues and strives to foster community across ideological divides. All of tonight's panelists have been vigorous and thoughtful advocates of conservative ideas. Patrick Deneen is Professor of Political Science and the David A. Potenziani Memorial Chair of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. According to former President Barack Obama, Professor Deneen's most recent book, Why Liberalism Failed, offers cogent insights into the loss of meaning and community that many in the West feel, issues that liberal democracies ignore at their own peril. Yuval Levin is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He wears many hats, including that of scholar, journalist, and policy advisor. Dr. Levin is the founding and current editor of the journal National Affairs. He also served as a member of the White House domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush and was executive director of the President's Council on Bioethics. His most recent book published last year is A Time to Build, colon, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Daniel McCarthy is the editor of Modern Age, a conservative review published by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He also serves as the director of the Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship Program at the Fund for American Studies and is a visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of Statesmanship at the Catholic University of America. Ashleen Menchaca Bagnulo is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Texas State University. She has published scholarly articles on a wide range of topics, including St. Augustine, James Madison, and Machiavelli. Professor Bagnulo has also published articles for a more general audience at the online journal, Public Discourse. Our moderator, Jed Atkins, is director of the Arete Initiative at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, where he is the E. Blake Byrne Associate Professor of Classical Studies and an Associate Professor of Political Science. An expert on Greek, Roman, and early Christian moral and political thought, Professor Atkins has published multiple books on Roman political thought. Thank you to all of our panelists for participating in what is sure to be a lively and thoughtful discussion. And finally, I wanted to give a special thanks to the Program for Public Discourse's program assistants, Hunter Matthews and Jonathan Nichols, who have made this and other events possible this year. Now I will turn it over to our moderator, Professor Jed Atkins. Thank you, Dean Rhodes, for that kind introduction. Thanks too to the Program for Public Discourse for inviting me and the other panelists to be part of this wonderful new Abbey Speaker Series. Thanks to my fellow panelists for joining us and to you, the audience, as well. I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's conversation on the future of conservatism. A couple of quick details about procedure. The panel will be recorded and available later on 
uh, the program's YouTube page. The panelists and I will spend roughly the first uh, 50 minutes or so in conversation, and then the last uh, 30 minutes will take question and answers from the audience. To submit a question during the talk, please use the question and answer function on the webinar uh, to enter your questions, and we'll try to take as many as uh, we can get to. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, uh, Ashleen, Patrick, Yuval, uh, Dan. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, our conversation this afternoon. Um, in order to talk about the future of conservatism, I think we need to start with the present state of conservatism. As on the political left, so there has been rapid change on the right in recent years. And one way to, I think, appreciate these changes that led to the present state of conservatism is to take a, a quick glance at recent history. Um, in 2010, uh, UVA political scientist Jim Caesar uh, published an essay on conservatism that sought to identify the common denominator uh, behind the different philosophies understood at the time to compose conservatism. The essay is called Four Heads in One Heart. And I thought, you know, this would also be a perfect essay uh, to cite on a Zoom panel on conservatism featuring uh, four heads. Um, the first of these heads, according to Caesar, was traditionalism. Um, the big name associated with traditionalism was Russell Kirk and a big publication, The Modern Age, uh, which uh, Dan McCarthy, uh, who's here with us tonight, uh, now edits. Traditionalism focuses on uh, preserving national and local traditions and communities, local schools, literature and culture, and it's uh, critical of the forces that disrupt them. Uh, so Kirk was as critical as, uh, of capitalism as of socialism. The second head was uh, universal natural rights-based conservatism, uh, which Caesar calls neoconservatism. It upholds the wisdom of the American founding as expressed in the Declaration of Independence and the universality of human rights. Perhaps the most prominent example of the implementation of this political philosophy um, was the, the George W. Bush um, administration. The third head is uh, libertarianism. Libertarians emphasize the free market and generally freedom from government interference out of a preference for spontaneous order. And the fourth head, according to Caesar, was the religious right. Uh, the religious right first emerged as a force in the 1980s and took the viewpoint that uh, there was a growing political and cultural threat to religion that required believers to meet uh, this threat with, uh, by taking political action and mobilization. Now, political uh, Caesar's account of conservatism strikes me as a really nice taxonomy as conservat of conservatism as it existed uh, from the 1980s through uh, roughly, say, 2015. Uh, and when I think about the current state of conservatism, it's pretty evident that I think we're going to have to start moving heads around. So help me with this process. Uh, what should be added and subtracted from this picture uh, to update it uh, to fit our present situation? Uh, Yuval, let's begin with you. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jed, first of all, for drawing this group together. Thanks to you and for the program of public discourse. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to be part of a panel like this and eager to learn from my fellow panelists here. You've certainly asked a very large question to start with, and I'm sure it's more than, than I can wrestle to the ground myself. But maybe I would start by saying that these kinds of taxonomies necessarily speak to the moment they're in. And I, I think that uh, the Jim Caesar's categorization, certainly useful for his purpose, it's a very powerful piece that I'd recommend to anyone. But I don't know that it really works as a description of the right over the generation or so that you suggest from the 80s to the mid 2010s say, I'm not sure I see the case for separating traditionalists and religious conservatives, for example, uh, except for a very particular purpose. I'm not sure I see the case for viewing neoconservatives as a kind of universal natural rights champions, except on a narrow set of issues, maybe especially foreign policy issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that kind of neoconservative, uh, I don't know that there are ever more than a dozen or, or so of them in this country of 300 million people. So I'm not sure that that classification is gonna be more useful to start with than the more familiar kind of three-legged stool metaphor, which divided conservatives into uh, you might say market people and cultural traditionalists and anti-communists. Um, and, you know, a lot of people throughout the, the Cold War era uh, fell into more than one category at once. That's how the movement worked, really. But I think the categories were very useful. Um, obviously, anti-communism, which was a kind of organizing principle for the whole, 
um, isn't there as an organizing principle and hasn't been now for some time. And in a sense, the question has been on the right, what is the organizing principle that holds together market people and, and cultural traditionalists? Um, and what else, as you say, might, might be added to that list? That's in a way the question we're asking now. Is that organizing principle something like the nation? Is it anti-elitism, just anti-leftism? Um, I think the right is struggling around questions like this now. There's no consensus answer at this point. Um, so that while we certainly have some market people and some traditionalists in a coalition together and some, you might say, just non-left foreign policy thinkers at this point, um, it, it's not really quite clear what it is that holds them together. And I think that's the question you're getting at. I would say to really answer that question, you'd have to take a step back and suggest and, and, and ask yourself, what do conservatives believe? What is an identifiable conservatism? To begin with. And I think that has to do with more than political issues and maybe reaches to something more like almost an anthropology. I think conservatives are committed to two truths about the human person that are in tension with each other as a practical matter. On the one hand, we believe that the human person is fallen or imperfect or sinful or in so somehow in need of formation before being capable of freedom that that formation requires strong formative institutions. And those are what we want to conserve, the family, the church, the community, the school, work, even political institutions that begin from the premise of human fallenness and, and try to form the human person. On the other hand, we also believe that the human person is made in a kind of divine image. And so that every person is possessed of some basic fundamental dignity equally, which we can understand as equal basic rights and some of those rights express themselves as constraints on what society can do to us. So the people are all equal, equally endowed with rights. These two anthropological premises, which I think you can find at the bottom of a lot of different kinds of conservative thinking, pull in different directions. The one towards strong formative social institutions, the other toward individual liberty. And I think you always find that tension in anything that can call itself conservative thought. Conservatism doesn't really defend one or the other. It defends the combination of the two, which is the free society, broadly speaking. And that combination needs defending because the, both parts of, of that combination are often under attack from the left in different ways. And I think that combination means that market people and traditionalists uh, do belong together. The combination of them was not some invention of a bunch of Yaleys in the middle of the 20th century. It's in a way of the essence of, of modern civilization. Um, it's been with us at least since uh, the late enlightenment. In some ways, elements of it uh, have been with us since, since the classical West began. But that combination is also practically incoherent in some ways, so that its defenders are always struggling with each other over their identity, their priorities. There's often a lot of tension between defenders of community morals and defenders of individual rights and freedom. Um, and that's what the right looks like. It looks like that tension. So that right now, the, the kind of struggle that we see makes sense. It's, it's not, it didn't come out of nowhere, even though this feels like an unusually divided and divisive moment on the right. There's one other thing I'd say, the, the, the right in America is not just conservatives, right? It is sometimes dominated by conservatives, not always. Um, and I would say at this point, the coalition of the right is also defined by a disaffection from an elite culture that is heavily dominated by the left. Conservatives are obviously disaffected from it, but so are other people. And the, the people whose engagement with politics is most and first and foremost moved by that disaffection with elite institutions aren't necessarily conservatives. They're anti-elite, they're populists. Sometimes they can be conservatives and sometimes not. And I think that tension too has been kind of characteristic of the American right for more than half a century. There is a populist strain in it that's not the same as the conservative strain. And maybe that's one head that I would add to your list. Um, so I, I guess my answer to your question is that I, I think something like a fusion of traditionalists and individualists is always going to be near the core of the American right. It's always going to draw in some populists. Um, and that's a coalition that's always going to be tense and uneasy. And yet it makes sense. And so to me, this moment doesn't feel totally different. It's not a complete break from 
the history of the American right, but it's a moment when those tensions are very much on the surface and have to be thought through in an unusually explicit way. Well, as you've always uh, speaking, I saw some heads nodding. And uh, so why don't we go around sort of counterclockwise and um, uh, on my screen. So Ashleen, uh, is there anything you would like to add um, to what uh, you've all to you've all summary? I thought that it was really brilliant and kind of a good way of parsing out the ways that there are tensions and how there will probably always be. But I think one question we have to ask is where is conservatism going to go demographically? Um, and what the answer to that question is, is going to have something to do with what conservatism begins to identify itself as publicly. Right now, it's very reactive. I know teaching um, in Texas, I have a lot of students who are interested in conservatism. They, they aren't necessarily conservatives, but they, they are recoiling from something on the left. And a lot of the, the profile of the right right now is composed of people who are recoiling from different things, but might prioritize different things. And it's really hard for us to make that coherent. And I think the demographics are gonna spell out the survival of conservatism, but then also the profile. Thanks. Patrick. Yeah, uh, yeah I appreciate um, Yuval. Um, I, I share his, um, uh, to a degree, his uh, correction to uh, to our mutual friend Jim Caesar, who you know doesn't necessarily need correction, but the the way in which he portrays the uh, the contemporary American conservative uh, dimension as these these four heads, uh, and I appreciated that he characterized it instead by talking about the again the sort of the, the now somewhat. Uh, Prosaic, uh, predictable, three-legged stool, but it it, it was a uh, it was a reality. Uh, it was a reality throughout uh, and following uh, the Cold War, and it, in particular, it was a stool that was made out of different pieces that all of which had their particular reasons for opposing communism or or opposing you know the creep of socialism in the United States, whether it was religious conservatives. Um, including Catholics, but not limited you know, to Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, uh, the kind of, you know, the hostility toward religion that you saw, especially in the Soviet Union, the kind of aggressive atheism uh, of, um, of, of not only Soviet communism, but broadly uh, increasingly on the left. Uh, and of course, uh, not just anti-communism, but I think, although it was only 12 neoconservatives, according to Yuval, it was a very influential uh, group of people uh, who, weren't merely anti-communist, but really began to develop, I think, um, theories of and practices of a kind of liberal internationalism, really seeing the need for um, uh, not, not just um, containing, in a sense, liberalism within one particular national tradition, but seeing it as a kind of gift to the entire world. And when you mentioned George W. Bush, that was really the essence of his second inaugural address, was a kind of evangelical form of liberal internationalism that we would spread liberalism uh, uh, throughout the world as a kind of gift to the world. And, and uh, um, I think what we have seen in the last several years, and I guess here I'll differ with you, Val, is not the, not the kind of you know, return of tensions uh, between the, the three legs, but the recognition that the stool was never really uh, all, that, all that stable, uh, that, that the three legs were, were held together by the external force, especially of the threat of communism, but that at least two of those legs, and the, the, um, uh, the, the in particular the, the, the two that uh, of the two that Yuval mentioned, the libertarian economic uh, strain uh, and the liberal internationalist strain, uh, I think would be very hard without the sort of presence and threat of communism to describe those as in some ways inherently conservative, uh, seeking to conserve a way of life or seeking to. Uh, preserve a tradition. In fact, they're both in kind of distinct ways, anti-traditional. Um, they seek to transform the world in a direction of liberal individualism, liberal freedom. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is more than just a kind of reiteration of, of certain tensions within conservatism, but a real question of whether that the form of that coalition will be able to continue. We've already seen the neoconservatives effectively sort of leave the Republican Party, uh, but not just that, but join quite fervently the Democratic Party. Bill, you know, Bill Crystal, I think, being most prominent among them. That that whatever seemed to once have separated them no longer separates them. 
Uh, and, I, and I think we're seeing you know, similar kinds of transmutations happening in the economic realm as well. I think it certainly as a consequence of, uh, of, of Trump's uh, election. But I think beyond that, I just think that there are real tensions. So I, I, I guess I'm not as, I, I'm not of the sem more sanguine view perhaps of Yuval that, that, that the stool can be reconstructed in some form. And nor do, I, nor do I particularly think that we need to reconstruct it in that form. I think we're in a time of real transition to a new and different kind of set of furniture. Uh, and the question in right now is what, is what the sort of pieces of, the, of, of that furniture will look like once the, once the living room is, re, is sort of redesigned. Dan, would you like to jump in? Yeah, we've covered a lot of uh, ground already, but I think uh, a few notes uh, can perhaps be added to uh, the foregoing remarks. Um, it seems to me there's an irony because as Patrick has noted, uh, what had been a three-legged stool that was conceived for largely defensive purposes during the Cold War era, especially with respect to foreign policy, uh, became a rather radicalized and perhaps even revolutionary agenda after the end of the Cold War and into the 1990s, where there really was both on the American left and on the right and in the center for that matter, uh, a belief that uh, the American way of life was something to be exported to the entire planet both economically and where necessary by the use of military force, and that we had a revolutionary message to bring to the entire planet. And this was a message of freedom. This was a message of modernity. This was a message of uh, development that would lead to a sort of consumer paradise for everyone. And uh, even communist China would be transformed by trade relations with the United States as a result of entering the WTO and whatnot. This was a, a very liberal agenda in the you know, sort of old sense of the word liberal. It was also a, quite a liberal agenda, new sense of the word liberal as well. Um, so both culturally and economically, I think it could be described as liberal. It could be described also as revolutionary in terms of the effect it was intended to have on uh, you know, states all around the world, regions of the world. And yet one reason why this revolutionary liberal agenda becomes uh, something that conservatives adopt in the 1990s and they stick to throughout the George W. Bush years is because of a sort of flawed conservatism. Uh, the flawed conservatism I have in mind here is a psychological kind of conservatism, which is simply a resistance to recognizing that circumstances have changed and therefore one's ideas and one's response to the world must change as well. So a three-legged stool, which I think had a very strong defensive logic and situational logic during the Cold War, became a kind of idol and it became a checklist and it became something that was an idée fixe for conservatives after the Cold War. They continued to behave as if the Cold War were still happening or as if you still had the same uh, need for American uh, military buildups as you had during the Cold War itself. And similarly with uh, liberal economics, um, it was threatened by communism during the Cold War, but at the, after the end of the Cold War, there was this belief among American conservatives that there was no real need to question uh, the gospel of liberal economics and to question the benefits that capitalism would bring not only to the world, but of course uh, to uh, other Americans right here at home as well. So a certain kind of psychological conservatism, a sheer intellectual inertia, I think led to conservatives sticking with a three-legged stool which had a purpose at one time, but became uh, transformed into quite a revolutionary agenda after the Cold War. What you're seeing right now is not only a reevaluation of all that, but also a response to the failures of that three-legged stool that continued into the uh, to early 2000s and into, in fact, uh, really up until the last four or five years. That, um, you know, in terms of our foreign policy, we've been very disappointed to see that we can get into wars much more easily than we can win them or get out. In terms of our economic policy and the results of globalization, we've seen that uh, this has been devastating for a great many communities within our country. And that um, you know, there's a certain amount of anxiety which possesses even the winners in our uh, liberal economic order. And, uh, and of course, it has not had the liberalizing effect politically and culturally upon the People's Republic of China that everyone in the 1990s assumed that uh, this global capitalist agenda would have. And then, of course, in terms of our own culture, in terms of the uh, status of our soul and the, the virtue of our republic, I think conservatives are deeply, uh, maybe pessimistic is, is perhaps putting it too strongly. They're certainly deeply troubled by the tendencies they see, which um, neither capitalism nor an aggressive foreign policy seems to be capable of countering. And in fact, uh, as you know, Patrick Dean's own works have pointed out, um, you know, capitalism and an aggressive foreign policy might actually be exacerbating uh, the moral difficulties that our country is facing. So while I do agree with you all that you do have these persistent poles in conservative thought or thought on the right uh, between uh, you know, sort of liberty and between a critique of power 
and between, um, on the other hand, uh, a commitment to human nature and to uh, an understanding of ourselves, uh, you know, and our, our higher uh, ends, as well as um, the tendency towards sinfulness that we all possess. Um, even though there is that persistent tension, I think the particular historical conditions we're facing right now are indeed uh, more like those that um, some of the others of us have mentioned, in that they're leading to a fracturing that is perhaps more um, pronounced than what we had seen uh, in recent decades. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, this fracture, fracturing is um, also very intellectually enlivening. Uh, I, I wrote an essay uh, you know, a few years ago pointing out uh, to how uh, revivified the uh, conservative quarterly journal seemed to have become. And I mentioned Yuval Levin's uh, National Affairs as one uh, key instance of that. Uh, Modern Age, uh, under my uh, predecessor's uh, uh, editorship, was another uh, example. And it seems to me there's a bit of an intellectual renaissance right now on the right and among conservatives, even as there is this great anxiety about the political future of uh, conservatism. Well, um, in addition to uh, changing our metaphor from uh, heads to stools, uh, you all have given us plenty uh, to talk about, I think, for the next 40 minutes or so. And maybe just one observation that I'll make uh, at sort of a larger level that has already come out on the table is uh, whether or not uh, conservatism in its different forms is primarily sort of a, um, a negative sort of reaction against uh, liberalism. Um, uh, which you might think, you know, I'm thinking of Ashleen's anecdote about her students are, you know, responding to something in the culture or uh, Patrick's point about, um, you know, the neoconservative sort of leaving, uh, you know, the Republican coalition or, or whether there's, uh, you know, Yuval uh, points out conservatism is for something and he sketched out sort of an anthropology uh, a certain uh, anthropology. Uh, so even now, I think, you know, there's there's uh, some differences that are uh, emerging. I want to move on, though, and I want to stay actually with, uh, you know, uh, with, with Dan, uh, because one term that is sort of a new term uh, that uh, uh, has been sort of introduced into the political lexicon of uh, conservatism is national conservatism. And so I wonder if you could help us understand national conservatism? And how does it relate to, if we want to use Caesar's term, which maybe we don't anymore, but traditionalism? Um, you know, and, and in particular, how, why does national conservatism matter, uh, you know, sort of for everyday Americans as we try to understand uh, the, the conservative uh, political landscape? Well, national conservatism is a new label, but in some ways it is drawing upon uh, tendencies which had been developing long before Donald Trump emerged on the political scene. So part of national conservatism is indeed what you would call nationalism and a concern with national borders, a concern with uh, citizenship, a concern with America's role in the world, whether it should be more of an internationalist kind of liberal international order preserving role, or whether it should be something that is focused on a, a you know, more narrow national interest for the United States itself. And uh, in terms of economics too, there is the question of whether our economy is a national economy that should serve our own citizens first and foremost, or whether our economy is devoted primarily and overall to freedom and to whatever uh, results freedom might produce, which may be uh, great benefits for Wall Street, but perhaps uh, setbacks for Main Street, and uh, perhaps you know, uh, growing power for um, uh, China in the world, and uh, you know, perhaps a less of an economic uh, role in the world for the United States, which we're not quite there yet, but it's certainly where the, uh, the tendencies are going. So national conservatism has that element of nationalism in it. And in some ways that was prefigured by uh, people who were called paleoconservatives back in the 1990s. And someone like Pat Buchanan, for example, stands out as a sort of um, a prophet of this uh, forthcoming conservatism. You could also, however, look at someone like uh, Ross Perot in the 1990s as also being, uh, you know, a kind of early uh, instantiation of a kind of nationalist conservatism. But the second uh, kind of uh, national conservatism, which is somewhat related to the first, but is you know, quite distinct in its own right, is um, what many of its own adherents call the new right. And this is uh, a rather youthful intellectual movement that believes that, uh, that uh, conservatism should not be afraid of the use of government power and including uh, federal government power. So a number of these national conservatives uh, are much more um, favorably disposed towards, for example, uh, pro-family uh, economic policies at the federal level than the conservatives who had preceded them. And uh, that was even true, uh, you know, that's a difference in fact, in some ways with the traditionalists of a past era, because traditionalists like Russell Kirk were also very skeptical of federalist programs, of federal programs, just as um, libertarians were. And the, the, the concern back then was always that 
uh, a federal program would lead to centralization. It would lead to a corruption of the very institutions it was trying to support. This is something you find not only in Russell Kirk, but also in figures like Robert Nisbet as well, who said that the idea of a kind of uh, national bureau for communities would be uh, a, a contradiction. So there's a little bit of a tension between the old traditionalism and the new national conservatism with respect to the, the role for the federal government in trying to support these lower levels of uh, our communities and our culture, uh, including the family itself. And then finally, I would say there's also a small element in national conservatism, which is an attempt to revive uh, the kind of mid 20th century uh, American national spirit uh, that might be personified by someone like uh, JFK. And my friend uh, Frank Buckley, for example, who's written a number of books about conservatism uh, you know, in uh, the 21st century, uh, will often look back to JFK as opposed to Ronald Reagan as an example of um, the kind of uh, ethos that conservatives today should embrace. Uh, again, it's, it's one that's less hostile perhaps to government power, but it's not primarily defined by government power so much as it is an idea of an America that has a bright future that is combining both uh, economic freedom with uh, a certain amount of you know, uh, government policy that is designed to create mobility for everyone as opposed to uh, having a system that tends to favor Wall Street and the most uh, financially advanced interests. So I'd say those three elements together compose um, national conservatism and how they're going to um, balance one another in the future and which of those tendencies will be dominant is something we'll find out, I think, in the next uh, four to 10 years. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I mean, one sort of element of that, maybe the first element that, you know, you mentioned sort of Pat Buchanan and, um, and I grew up in, in, in central Pennsylvania where, you know, in the in the, the late 80s, early 90s, there were quite a lot of Buchananites and those Buchananites uh, typically turned into Trump voters. And so, so on one hand, we have, would you say a sort of a populist wing of uh, sort of national conservatism, and then perhaps the second branch that you mentioned, uh, you call it sort of the new right based uh, upon, um, I, I think you sort of sort of respect for the institution of uh, the family, and it's very interesting. I'm thinking of, you know, Yoram Hazoni's book on, um, on, uh, on, on important book on, on nationalism, and I think he's part of this movement. You know, he begins by, by emphasizing that the important institution is, is the family, not the individual, uh, which is, you know, the in focus on the individual sort of a liberal internationalism. Um, so, so it seems like we have a sort of a populist wing and then maybe a wing that, that is not so sympathetic to populism. Is, is that uh, generally right? Well, I, I think there's a lot of crossover between the two wings. And uh, as far as populism goes, I'll, I'll maybe add a footnote to what Yuval had said. Um, it seems to me that there is this question of the integrity of our national institutions, the institutions that should be forming us as people. And if those institutions have taken a turn toward revolutionary ideology, then one would expect to see conservative attitudes towards those institutions change. Instead of being defensive attitudes, they would now become critical attitudes. And I think that explains uh, certainly the intellectual populism that you see among many national conservatives. They see the institutions such as our universities and our, our major media outlets as being fundamentally corrupted and turned in a revolutionary direction that wants to transform uh, ordinary American public life. And so uh, those conservatives who are concerned about this see um, a certain affinity or have a certain affinity with um, sort of grassroots populists who may simply have a more emotional rejection to uh, the kind of leadership that our elites are providing. So I think in general, um, there is actually less tension right now among national conservatives along lines of populism or you know, sort of technocracy than one might expect. And in fact, it's surprising, but you know, many of the leading political figures who are identified with a kind of populist insurgency on the right, uh, in fact, have Ivy League degrees. And uh, they're certainly their uh, you know, Senate staff and uh, White House staff are people who are very well educated and um, who uh, you know, in many ways resemble the very class that they're fighting against, the college educated uh, sort of uh, liberal elite. Yeah, so now we've gotten, uh, thanks Dan, so now we've gotten populism on the table and, and that's obviously, uh, an important development in thinking about politics, both on the right and the left. And um, since this is a panel on conservatism, let's stay with the right. And uh, so how do we account for the rise of, of populism, especially right populism connected uh, uh, to Trump? Can, can you be both a populist and a conservative? Um, Ash Lane, can we uh, maybe start with you for this? I think the answer to whether or not you can be both a populist and a conservative is going to end up being answered by the question of what we decide the nation is. Because one of the sort of elusive things I think in the conversation that we're having is that 
whatever shape uh, conservatism is going to take, it's a realigning moment and there needs to be some sort of shared consensus. And I think when I think about the sort of reactive nature or the fractured nature of different parts of the right presently, I think what they share actually is a sort of longing for something that is whole, something that they belong to, um, and something that they can share among themselves. But I don't think that they have defined that yet. And the problem with populism um, and defining that, I think, is that you have to have a coherent idea of who the people are. Um, and you can do this on demographic lines, you can do this on economic lines, which would overlap with demographic lines, I think, a lot. Or you can do it sort of based around, I think, this kind of nostalgia for the past, which has been what I think is motivating a lot of um, the movement that we've seen since 2016. But we don't really have a shared narrative of the past and we don't have a coherent identity about it, I don't think. Even if you, you just put aside the 1619 project, which is on the left, on the right, you're going to have all sort of inter Nicene debates that go back to Buckley and the, the John Birch Society. Even Buckley himself was said that, you know, in the South, it was better um, for what he called the more advanced race to have more political power. So if you're going to talk about populism as conservatism, you have to talk about what we are sharing a longing for and who the we is. Um, I think for me at least, it seems like there are so many variables in how this could go. And it has to do with what opinion leaders get out in front. Um, and it has to do with what sort of slogans really touch people. I think when we look at the CPAC um, poll that came out this year, um, the priorities were very different than they were even four years ago. Um, the pro-life priorities were lower, the Second Amendment priorities were higher, anti-immigration higher, right? So um, I'm not even sure in the long run that we would be conservative in the sense of conserving something that actually exists. Patrick, um, yeah, same question uh, for you. Um, what accounts for the rise of populism and can you be both a populist and a conservative? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I'm hesitant to <laughs> invoke the name of Edmund Burke with, uh, with Yuval sitting there. He wrote the book, uh, although I was the dissertation, one of the advisors, so I guess I can speak on it. I, in a way, I think, um, I think it, uh, the, you know, the rise of what, what we often describe as populism as a conservative uh, phenomenon is more a return to the original um, form of conservatism that was you know, developed in a different direction as a consequence, in particular in the American experience, as a consequence to the Cold War in just the terms we were talking about uh, several minutes ago. So that the, the traditional form, you could say, the original form of conservatism is, is in particular um, a, uh, arises out of an experience of going all the, you know, going back to the French Revolution um, and in, in various uh, moments since then, in which a leadership class, an elite, um, operates as a kind of revolutionary force in society. And something that Dan was speaking eloquently to, uh, that it operates as a revolutionary force that um, succeeds or attempts to upend the traditional forms of life of, of ordinary people. That it, uh, that it not only does it uh, seek a kind of revolutionary movement in, um, in, in society, but it actually holds those traditional forms of life with a kind of disdain and uh, regards them as, as backward and needing to be extirpated, as uprooted. Uh, and this was, of course, this was uh, Burke's, exactly Burke's argument in his, um, uh, in, in his um, thought, uh, considerations on the French Revolution, which was a defense of the sort of ordinary virtues of everyday people that accumulate sort of uh, 
through a kind of process of sort of temporal sedimentation over time that have a certain kind of wisdom inherent in those practices uh, simply by a kind of trial and error of people living over a long period of time uh, in particular places and with particular ways of life. And obviously this can lead to you know, just the kinds of, uh, of, of injustices that Ashleen rightly highlights. But at the same time, it leads also to forms of stability and order and expectation and a uh, sort of generational continuity that when you're not wealthy, when you're not um, you know, well equipped for the global international economic order, those are, those are the best um, forms of support that you have as ordinary people, just the continuity of place, of tradition, of community, and things that Yuval writes eloquently about, those kinds of institutions. I think that what we, think, what we see today as a rise of populism is a reassertion of older kind of conservatism. Now, now, it's a conservatism, and we need to be clear about this, that has been in some ways uprooted and destroyed, or it's a reaction that's been uprooted in which the conservative impulse or way of life has been uprooted and destroyed. It's not coming from a place of health. It's not coming from a place where you know, they have, you know, the people today have those traditions really intact in lots of healthy ways. In fact, it's coming almost as a kind of plea for help. This revolutionary economic order, this revolutionary social order has upended everything that we knew about the world. It's difficult for us to form families. It's difficult for us to hold down jobs. It's difficult for us uh, to have the kinds of uh, forms of stability and order in our community life. You know, I live in this part of the world in the Midwest and you see it so vividly just in the places where you travel, these towns that were once flourishing that are just shells of, of, of what they were just 50, 100 years ago. So it's, it's a kind of, I would say that it's a, it comes from a kind of place of a conservative impulse, but in the wake of the devastation that's been wrought by these revolutionary forces. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's incumbent on a leadership class today, on an elite class today, to address this in a way that's not merely condescending and dismissive, but supportive of the needs of ordinary people to have the kinds of institutions, to have the kinds of practices that allow them to flourish, even if they're not getting degrees uh, from the Ivy Leagues and the jobs on Wall Street. And unless we do that, uh, I fear that we're in for, you know, for some extremely turbulent times that you know, I mean, we've, we've only begun to see the beginning. And we may look back to the last four years with nostalgia uh, if the leadership class doesn't uh, begin to really clue into, I think, what's, what's really happening uh, out there today. Well, Yuval Patrick has, has mentioned your name a couple of times in, in his, his answer, and, um, and, and um, you know, you've just written a book. Um, well, it's been out a you know, n- number of months, but in the last year, it's been out a, a book on the lack of trust in American institutions called A Time to Build. Um, and it would seem that populism would be, at least of a sort, would be a particular threat uh, to the stability of institutions. And so I was wondering if you could speak to this question uh, within the context of uh, the account of institutions and the threat uh, to institutions uh, that you defend in, in that book. Well, thank you. I, I, I would certainly associate myself with a lot of what's been said by the other three here. I, I think that there I think that a conservative populism is not a contradiction if it arises in the face of a revolutionary establishment, which is what we've seen. Um, And so one contradiction begets another. It is true, it seems to me, that populism is unavoidably threatening to institutions and so is in some tension with conservatism on its face. But it shares with conservatives in this moment a critique of a kind of elitist progressivism that is using the power of institutions to revolutionize uh, our social order. Um, And so it has some common cause with uh, a genuinely tradition-minded conservatism. Conservatives have sometimes squared that circle over time by opposing not the institutions, but the elites who run the institution, even by opposing those elites in the name of those institutions. So if you think about God and Man at Yale, uh, William F. Buckley's first book, it's basically an argument for defending the university from the professors. Um, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And in a way, it's a kind of, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the form of a lot of conservative resistance to the rise of a fundamentally progressive elite in America over the past two or three generations. Um, it's a way of saying to America's elites that they're not living up to their institutional obligations. And so to their 
obligations to our larger society. There are ways, of course, in which today's right-wing populism is closer to actually rejecting the institutions themselves or to concluding that they're just too far gone to be saved. Um, I think that is a, a threat to what conservatives can offer society, though it's understandable. I mean, looking at the institutions, it isn't hard to see why we might need to conclude that they can't be saved, but I don't think that's ultimately right. And I don't think that's ultimately the right way to think about the obligation that conservatives have to the next generation. It's a reaction to the power of the left and to the way that the left uses that power. So again, it's entirely uh, understandable. I just think that it leads us toward a kind of despair um, that isn't ultimately the way for traditionalists to think about our role in society. We start with low expectations, so we should expect to have to do the work of, of fighting for the space for moral formation in every generation. That's how we should approach the challenge of the present, not with despair, not by telling the rising generation that the West is lost, that they're inheriting a pile of garbage. That's just not true. Um, we have faced bigger problems than this in the past, and we will face these problems that we have now and can sustain the space for another generation to do the same after us. And that's ultimately all we can hope for in this world anyway. And we should try to do that with gratitude and with dignity and with good cheer and with hope, but it's not easy. And I don't think we should dismiss the populist impulse, which speaks as Patrick suggests and as Dan suggested as well, to a very real problem that needs to be addressed in a real way, not just in the abstract and not passively. The, the defense of the future of the West requires a fight for the institutions as well as a fight against them. And I think that's what conservatives now are called to do. We have to do that in ways that keep in mind what we're protecting and conserving, and we don't always manage that, but uh, there's no avoiding that fight, it seems to me. Thanks. And I want to, before I shift the, the conversation away from this topic, I, I do want to come back and touch base very quickly with Patrick. Uh, Patrick uh, wrote a very important book a few years ago that was, uh, as we heard in the introduction, uh, um, uh, commended by uh, President Barack Obama and uh, why liberalism failed. And, um, and, and the answer that you give in that book, Patrick, um, for why we have a widespread distrust in American institutions of the sort that the distrust that you've all talking about, uh, huge disparities in income equality, uh, Americans' foreign policy failure, the rise of populism, our fraying social fabric, um, comes from a, a fundamental problem uh, that, that's deep rooted in the American political uh, tradition, perhaps even back to the, the very founding of our country. And you identify the philosophy behind this problem as, as liberalism. And and, and you have, you're speaking of something that is a particular sense of liberalism, that you're not meaning sort of left and right. You think liberalism is a problem for, you know, as many self-professed conservatives as you do as uh, progressives. And so could you just very quickly um, uh, say what liberalism is and, um, and maybe just give one quick practical uh, sort of implication for this discussion for conservative politics from that first book? Sure. Uh, or from that last book, rather. You've had many, book, many yeah. books. Yeah, <laughs> that is, okay. It's the only book that matters, apparently. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, obviously, this is, it's, a, it's a term that has uh, such a variety of meanings, and people will define it in, in, in all kinds of different ways. But one way I think of thinking about it, and I think a really essential way of thinking about liberalism, is, is to think about the word, of course, uh, liberty. Uh, and the particular way that I think the sort of architects of the modern form of liberalism uh, really think about liberty, and and you could say it comes out of it comes out of uh, it's not it's not evil. It comes out of a noble impulse, which is that uh, people should be free to define the kind of lives they they want to lead, uh, that they shouldn't be um, forced into roles and positions and uh, a status and a profession and a place uh, and um, a religion and so forth, you know, against their choice and against their will. And so it was, you know, it, it was proposed in a society in which you could say it was you know, heavily constrained, that the choices of individuals was, was heavily constrained by all of the kinds of institutions uh, that we're today seeing in kind of disarray and disrepair. Uh, so you could say that the, the liberal form of freedom, which is, you know, the, the, the ability to define yourself who I am, not to be defined by any inherited role, 
any inherited status or definition of who I am according to my place. I mean, think of all the names that are the older names that have, uh, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, right? Uh, which, you know, means that he's from a particular place and of a particular family. Uh, or in my tradition, if your name begins with the letter O, your last name begins with the letter O, it just told you who you were from, O'Connor, O'Callaghan. Uh, so the world was one in which those aspects of your identity were defined. And in many ways, liberalism was the effort to um, allow people and to permit people uh, to create a society in which people could pursue a, a form of self-identification. But you could also say it becomes a kind of project where it's not just a permission to do that, but it becomes increasingly, in a sense, mandatory uh, uh, that one do that. Uh, that. That the society has to be shaped and formed in such a way in which there's no obstacle to self-definition. So that um, a kind of, you know, what, what some scholars call a kind of choice architecture is created in which, in which on, one only has choices, uh, in which there is no, in a sense, given, uh, in which exceedingly few institutions that once would have been thought of as deeply formative now have to become not just optional, uh, but increasingly be, be, to be seen as um, likely to be oppressive, likely to be uh, to, to limit the kinds of choices I can make about, about my self-definition. So that it's ideal to raise a child without any religion increasingly, without any sense of you know, who they are in the world, without any sense of what place they might want to or ought to live in, uh, without a sense of a history or a culture or a tradition. That this is the sort of liberal freedom. You could say we create a world that's not unlike the world of the state of nature or the individual uh, that exists in the state of nature, a person without a place, without a history, without a culture, without a religion, without any kind of definition uh, of, of who, who they are, who they might understand themselves to be. And that what's needed is to create a kind of massive architecture to create the conditions of this freed human being. And th those two forms of architecture, we've, in some ways we've talked about, uh, an increasingly revolutionary economic structure a, for, a market that now transcends any political unit. Uh, it, it's it no longer is the market as a, a place within the city as it would have been in Athens. The market encompasses all cities. It transcends any political boundaries and borders and defines not just who we are spatially, but it defines almost every aspect of our lives. Uh, the market, the sense of market choices uh, sort of buries itself deep into the human psyche so that every aspect of our life is in a sense, turned into a set of market transactions. I mean, you, know, you watch students you know, on Tinder or something, you know, swiping left, I, I, I understand that much, that you know, the partner they're going to have, potentially you know, what was at least supposed to be a life partner is, is, a, is somebody that I shop for. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore marriage and relationships begin to take on that kind of form of, of market mentality. And then in the realm of the sort of social sphere, the kind of revolutionary social world that we live in today in which you know, all of those traditional institutions, uh, family, church, religion, uh, community, and so forth are increasingly under attack as recidivist, as uh, oppressive institutions that need to be redefined, if not outright eliminated. And therefore we shouldn't be surprised that it's especially those people who don't thrive in a kind of world without boundaries. Uh, in a world without any kind of sense of who I am and where I am and, uh, and the kind of world and the place that I come from, uh, that it's these people in particular uh, who have suffered the most under these conditions of, of borderlessness, of limitlessness, uh, of a kind of la sort of absence of, of defined forms, what Tocqueville would have called the forms that we need as human beings, um, uh, and have challenged both the economic openness, borderlessness of our world, uh, as well as the kind of um, social limitlessness of the world in, in very inchoate forms, in forms that are not, uh, it seems to me, well, very well developed and well defined. And here again, I'll just echo what I said earlier, which is that I think one of the ways that we're going to see, you know, in precisely the way that I think Dan was uh, discussing, this fer ferment of a kind of intellectual vibrancy on the, uh, in the conservative world. Something people on the left think is a contradiction in terms is, is precisely uh, what, um, you know, what kind of world uh, without overthrowing uh, a, a world in which people have the opportunity uh, to define the kind of human being they're going to be. Nevertheless, that they'll have 
in some sense, the, the kinds of places and the kinds of forms that allow them to develop the personal capacities to flourish, even if they're not gonna be one of the winners in, in our economy, or they're not gonna be one of the, the people who glide above uh, the sort of the consequences of a globalized world. And, and I think there, there where you know, exactly you're seeing the discussions that a generation ago you wouldn't have seen. Do we need governmental support for families? Uh, do we need um, support for communities? Are there ways that the public sphere can assist the civil sphere? Uh, and, I, and I think that those are questions that a, that a generation ago would not have been on the table in the conservative world. And you're seeing them increasingly uh, vividly uh, in discussion and debate. Thanks, Patrick. And, and you know, I think sort of continuing on this line, and now I, I, I want to bring in Ashleen, um, because, uh, you know, sort of in thinking about, um, you know, you might say, um, you know, creating opportunities within conservatism, Athleen, Ashleen, you've written, I think, powerfully on the need uh, for conservatism to be more welcoming to women and racial minorities. Uh, so how, in your view, has the conservative movement fallen short in these areas? I think that one of the tensions actually it comes out of what uh, Professor Janine was saying, which I think is right, which is we, we have this past where there was a metaphysics that would at least help to create roles for the structuring of society and your nation, your race, your birth, your sex would be a part of this. And then this kind of all comes apart at a certain point for different reasons. And I think what you find in modernity is that humans need something like that. So one thing that's been interesting for me studying uh, racial minorities is that even though they have higher rates of maybe different types of um, social and economic struggles uh, comparatively, they have a lower suicide rate. And one of the things that people have suggested is that they have a lower suicide rate because they have something like what the, I think the, the term is familialism where they can think of themselves as moving to a role that they're connected to by birth. And so the challenge I think presently is once that we've seen that a lot of what we used to think about the differences between men and women, for example, didn't have to do with capacity. Like it didn't have to do with how smart I was or it didn't have to do with, um, especially as we're more technological, right? How strong I am because I can do different things on the computer, right? I'm not necessarily doing things with my hands. Um, when you enter into that sort of space, then I think everyone feels like there is no identity, there is no role. And so what I think we need to do is to look at the sources where we can have roles. And this is part of why I think the conservative movement has failed with regard to minorities and with regard to women. A lot of times the way that it was pitched to me growing up, I remember is that you need to stay home and raise a family. And that's very honorable. And I have respect for people who do that. Um, but I didn't need to do that uh, as my life has turned out to show. And um, I think there, there are going to be people who hear things like that and they can't they, they see a role for them and it's like too tight of a box. I think it's over definition on the part of conservatives. And then sometimes I think they over define um, the, themselves or they out define themselves out of appealing to minorities because the obvious appeal to minorities is religion. The rates of religiosity are far higher among uh, black Americans and Latino Americans than among the, the general white population. And so in a lot of ways, their rhetoric should be an easy fit, but they, they, they shoot themselves in the, the foot. They don't, they don't have the broad enough understanding of who their audience might be to be able to appeal to minorities more. So like an example would be, I followed with interest the nationalism um, movement and the sort of the, the major national conference uh, that took place there. And I remember, you know, there were times where people made some people, not everybody there, um, made it sound like we just need immigration from countries that are white because those are the countries that are most like us. 
But if you look at what the nation actually is, you will see that Latinos and African Americans and all kinds of people have contributed to this thing we now have. So when conservatives speak about the nation, for example, that's the platform they should be speaking. And, and it would be much easier, I think, than to slip in sort of naturally and say, hey, you know, we, we see that you value the family and we see you have high levels of religiosity. They're also going to be more socioeconomically, I guess, populist for, for lack of a better word. So if we are moving in that direction, they are already there. Um, so I think in the long run, it's gonna take the imagination of people who are at the heads of the conservative movement to familiarize themselves with the kinds of communities they have in their country, be it with regard to women or race, and what the realities of those people's lives are. I, I think, you know, when you're talking about the family, um, you, you know, sometimes when I hear the family talked about on the right, it's like the nuclear family. But a lot of Latinos, for example, have a nuclear family, but it's nested in a generational family. And so this sort of image of what we're aiming for in the, in the working class, right, it, which I think is the right place to move to, is not reflective, I think, of the people who could be in a working class coalition. Um, thanks. And, you know, it's, it's uh, sort of interesting, sort of as I listen to your answer, I mean, in some ways you sort of anchored uh, your, you know, sort of account of, of what the uh, future could be, and let's say a uh, um, multi-ethnic sort of working class coalition in some of the categories um, that were already put out on the table, but, but, but a, maybe a more precise or accurate or true sort of understanding, let's say, of the nation. Um, so that was quite, quite interesting. It seems like you're suggesting that perhaps re conservatism has within itself sort of the resources to, uh, let's say, um, you know, promote uh, better uh, racial equality. Is, is, that, is that fair? It, it, it depends on who gets the ball, but yes. Mm -hmm. And I think we, ha we don't have a very good understanding of identity politics. I think we're too dismissive of it. Um, if you look at white hegemony in the past, like, Caldwell has this great book uh, about um, you know, the age of entitlement, but he describes the American South as being um, democratic, even when the Black population was not enfranchised. And there's no way that that can be described as democratic unless you're going to be willing to say that huge parts of the nation that you're supposed to be you know, in solidarity with didn't deserve to have some sort of role in, in the polis or in the community. And I think that there are, there has to be a sort of reckoning with the, the history of America, not just since the founding, but actually since reconstruction. Um, and I think in reconstruction, you see the pitting against each other, this is what Du Bois says, of the white worker and the non-white worker, so that they don't ally with each other, so that they cannot actually have some sort of standing against the property class, they see each other as enemies, right? So if you look at that era in American political development, I think we see the fruit of that now. And the, there are parts of conservatism that have held on that too much. But what conservatism does well, I think, and does better than the left, is identity politics is too flat. Um, identity politics is not able to, for example, explain why Cubans were voting for Trump or Latinos, Mexican-Americans, where my family is from on the border of Texas are voting for them. They're voting for him actually for different reasons than each other. And it would be interesting to compare the Cuban and the Mexican-American here. But I think on the left, there's not any capacity to see a difference in Latinos or Blacks, right? Or then to see a, um, to, to ask themselves where those differences originate. And there's a sort of pejorative um, attitude towards things that they tend to value, like the family or like religion. And that's the part that's strong for the conservatives. That's where they can do the pooling is is in that area 
Um, and I think it's, it's a natural fit, but it will require a sort of reorienting of the self. Thanks, Ashleen. And we've, we've, gone, we've gone a little bit past 6.30. And so now let's uh, transition and start working in some questions from uh, the audience. And um, I may withhold a question about sort of the prediction of the future of conservatism sort of for the very end um, of this time. But, uh, but the first question I think is an important question to introduce sort of at this point uh, from the audience. And, um, and this person says, uh, we've had a very wide ranging conversation about a lot of things and a lot of quite different uh, perspectives, including um, I think some themes that uh, that, that uh, many people aren't used to hearing associated with conservatism. And so this person asks, um, can we distinguish conservatism from liberalism? Um, in other words, what have we said? Um, uh, what have you said um, and identified with a conservative a conservatism that a liberal would reject or you would expect a liberal to reject? Um, so, so they're asking us to distinguish very clearly conservatism from liberalism and, and maybe a good way to do that is just by thinking about sort of the opposite. What would, a, what would a someone who, who you wouldn't expect to be a conservative, a liberal sort of reject uh, that you believe is central to conservatism? And uh, Dan, um, let's uh, start with, with you on this question. Sure, I think uh, Ashleen gave uh, some indication uh, where some of these differences lie that uh, in talking about different groups of Americans, progressives tend to have a racial framework that they want to apply. And uh, it can be a very crude one that fails to distinguish, for example, between Mexican Americans and Cuban Americans. Um, the other thing too, is even if we look at religion, we have to keep in mind that religion is very closely tied to ethnicity. And it used to be that churches in America, the Irish Catholic Church, you know, next door to the Italian Catholic Church were actually quite different culturally. And if you tried to approach them both using the same sort of um, Republican message, especially if it was being related by some mainline Protestant, it would probably fail. So you really do have to take account of this granular and historical and traditional element uh, in human communities. They're not just uh, you know, conservatives who approach them uh, you know, simply as consumers, which I think is what you've seen many libertarians do, or as people who just want freedom. If you approach them simply as people who have uh, you know, historical grievances or historical injustices in the, that they've suffered, um, that, is, that is far too crude. And in fact, the conservative foundations in localism and in uh, you know, the sort of real human existence is something that can be used very effectively by conservatives to reach out to new communities. As far as the difference between, you know, sort of liberalism and conservatism in general is concerned, I think Yuval was on exactly the right track, that there is a different anthropology. And uh, as Patrick Deneen said, the anthropology of liberalism seems to come down to the idea that uh, human beings are unhappy because they are oppressed by uh, social institutions that have been in existence for you know, any number of centuries or millennia for that matter, and that by liberating ourselves from these institutions, we therefore will find happiness that we've never had before. And you know, there are persons for whom that may be true, especially circumstantially. But on the other hand, if you remove all of the ties to these institutions and these old identities, you're actually want, left with a void. And then the question becomes, what's going to fill that void? And often the answer to that is power is going to fill that void or psychopathology is going to fill that void. Ideology is going to fill that void. A conservative, I think, has to be uh, attuned enough to our human nature in general. And again, I, I commend some of the things that you've all have said about this, our, our, our rights as human beings, to be able to critique existing institutions and to be able to critique our traditions while at the same time being able to make a case for maintaining what is good in them and maintaining their overall form and framework. And uh, you know, Edmund Burke really is a, a model in this sense. I mean, his first uh, you know, sort of main published work was a vindication of natural society, which on the face of it is a satire taking shots at the idea of, um, uh, well, Viscount Bolingbroke's idea that you could kind of have a, get rid of uh, established religion, get rid of any kind of religious tradition. Uh, Burke then you know, satirically applies that to politics as well and says, well, why can't you just get rid of you know, all established states and have uh, anarchy and then won't we be better, be better off? And in fact, Burke's whole career is dedicated to showing why that is not the case. That the, um, the things we enjoy now, the goods that we have in our lives, not material goods, but most of all, civil goods, spiritual goods, political goods, these are all things that we have attained through enormous amounts of work enormous amounts of shared striving. And uh, to write them off because of the, you know, sort of horrors of the past would be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It would be an absolutely tragic and uh, irrecoverable mistake. And I think liberalism is in danger of doing that because while it does, you know, have a, you know, some truth to the critique it makes of American history, 
The fact is so much of the rest of the world, not only historically, but even now, is much more radically hostile to and you know, dangerous to uh, liberalism and to minorities, wherever they might be, than the United States is. And uh, we have to be sure that in justly critiquing ourselves, we are not losing a uh, sense of you know, the, the world stage and uh, the historical stage and that uh, we're in grave danger if we you know, simply tear down our own ethos, our own institutions, our own past, and uh, leave ourselves vulnerable to uh, whatever waves of power might be emanating from other societies, which have, in many cases, records that are far worse than our own. Yeah, so I mean, to summarize this really great, I mean, in some ways you're saying, you know, there's sort of a negative answer and that's going to Ash Lean. There's a certain account, let's say, of, uh, of, of identitarian uh, sort of politics that conservatism rejects, and then also a positive uh, sort of anthropological sort of account that you've all had laid out, laid out earlier that uh, conservatism is for. Um, uh, Patrick and Yuval, you indicated you wanted to add, would you, uh, do you want to add in? No, you're good, Yuval? Well, well sure, I, I, oh, yeah, I think I, I think what Dan said was just beautifully stated and, and I wouldn't want to take away from it by trying to uh, simply repeat it. I, I do think that there's also a way to understand that in terms of um, what it is that, how it is that left and right tend to understand political questions. I think precisely for the reasons that Dan laid out, the left tends to approach political questions in terms of oppressor and oppressed, to think about who is pressing down on whom as a reason for thinking about why there are problems in the world. Conservatives tend to think about the world in terms of order and disorder. We think there are problems when there are failures to establish some kind of social order. And we think that our social institutions can establish that order and therefore in a sense liberate us. Whereas progressives tend to think our social institutions oppress us. And that difference between a politics of oppressor and oppressed and a politics of order and disorder, I think accounts for a huge amount of the talking past each other that happens between left and right. And it's rooted in precisely the set of differences that Dan so beautifully got at, um, which really runs very deep. I mean, it is anthropological in a sense. It, it, does, it does require us to make an assumption about what the human person needs in order to thrive and flourish. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Yuval. And I, I think we can, um, I mean, that's, um, you know, very nicely summarized both of you. And why don't we go ahead and move on to the next question. Uh, and the next question is, um, uh, 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 well, I, I think it's a, maybe a question, maybe a rhetorical question, but the question is, how can conservatism of any type survive with media, big tech, and educational institutions taking sides? Um, Patrick, why don't we start uh, uh, with you on this? I'd, I'd like to know the answer to that too, actually. <laughs> uh, it is, I think it's, you know, maybe the, the one of, if not the biggest question and the most difficult question to grapple with, it's certainly among them. Uh, so, I mean, we've been talking a lot about disintegration of, uh, of sort of the lives of average Americans and, um, you know, how the, how the effects, especially of a kind of, of a kind of revolutionary uh, both, you know, sort of economic order and a social order uh, has uh, really deeply, I think, um, and, and uh, profoundly, and perhaps, you know, I don't want to say irretrievably, but um, uh, close to irretrievably uh, damaged uh, the prospects for a renewal of culture, a renewal of um, the, the stability and order that, um, that, that uh, uh, Dan and, uh, and Yuval were talking about. I think, though, the, um, the more malevolent form that this revolutionary elite today takes uh, is precisely in those areas. Uh, big tech, a kind of, you know, kind of a unholy alliance in a way between big tech, uh, contemporary media, uh, and the institution I've you know, spent my adult life in, uh, higher education, uh, completely dominated by uh, fairly like-minded people, a kind of professional class, Call it today the meritocracy, uh, and I think the I I think that you know they're they're on the one hand they've accumulated such massive forms of concentrated power. I mean, obviously in the case of big tech, uh, literally you know as close to to sort of a, a modern form of nineteenth century monopolies as one could as one could imagine today, uh, and uh, the the way in which uh, the the worldview of the, those who run those corporations today is now largely echoed and supported 
by the institutions that might once have been those that would have criticized this ac accumulation and centralization of economic power, in particular media uh, and uh, universities or ed higher education or education more broadly, that there's a kind of consensus uh, view uh, and worldview that's shared across these various uh, institutions. Uh, I, I do think that uh, in, this almost brings in your last question. There, there are ways in which I, I, I tend to think that the future of conservatism, if it is to be a viable political movement in the United States, in a weird way is actually gonna look a lot more like an older democratic party. Uh, it's going to be uh, economically, what we would call economically more liberal. Uh, and it's particularly going to be suspicious of and even hostile to concentrated forms of economic power uh, in a way that in a previous generation, conservatives were concerned with and hostile to concentrated forms of political power. And if you look at the landscape today, it's, it, it seems to me it's much more concerning the concentration of economic power, especially if you're a conservative looking at the power of, of big tech to come in and bully sovereign state legislators and governors uh, in terms of what their policies will be. And which we've seen time and time again, my own state of Indiana being bullied by the likes of Apple and Amazon uh, in recent years over questions of religious liberty. And we just saw this happen uh, with the NCAA uh, in South Dakota in just the past several days. I think there's going to be a lot more appetite for the use of political power, national political power, uh, to begin to exercise sovereign authority over these tech industries. And at the same time, I think you're going to see without necessarily destroying the institutions of higher education, I think that there's going to be a concerted effort among conservatives to lessen the power uh, of especially elite educational institutions, um, uh, perhaps going after or in some way constraining the use of, uh, of endowments or forcing the use of endowments uh, to support uh, uh, more, more tuition and more equalized, uh, or let's say more uh, tuition for uh, um, students who might not typically be able to attend Ivy League schools. But I also think uh, it's very likely and something I would personally like to see is a lot more public support uh, for trade schools, uh, for schools uh, that, that um, foster skills uh, that I think we're going to be in desperate, we already are in desperate need of, uh, for people to become much more economically self-standing uh, in, in, in a world in which being able to be your own boss in a profession that can't be provided over a phone line is going to be an extraordinarily important skill to have. Uh, so I, I see in an interesting way, a conservatism that, you know, it, in light of very different circumstances we're in now, will be both um, thinking about the use of public power uh, that constrains, econo you know, titanic economic powers, but in particular for the end of supporting you know, what we might today call more traditional family values, or at least the kinds of the forms of stability that allow uh, for the flourishing of people within uh, the kinds of, of institutions and forms of life uh, that, uh, that do require stability and that do require continuity. So I, in, in an interesting way, I think there's a kind of transition taking place where the revolutionary party will be the party, uh, you know, that, um, uh, will be consolidated in one party uh, and a more, let's say less, we could say a less liberal party, uh, a party that's suspicious both of liberal economics and liberal sort of social movements will be more increasingly concentrated in, 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 in a conservative party. Ashleen. So I have two responses to that. One is that when you're thinking about something like big tech, I would focus on the medium of itself, right, tech. So if we have this problem where we've got this sort of un, um, uh, unaddressed longing, right, for consensus or for a role, what the medium of tech does is it denatures you more. So you can have different avatars of yourself in different ways and you can play different roles and then you can just drop them. And so you, you sort of have this impression of human nature as being uh, undetermined and of your sort of power uh, of defining yourself as being limitless. But then in the end, this leaves you more hungry, more unmoored. I think that the best thing that could happen right now that conservatives could do 
with regard to big tech is um, to do a little bit of what Professor Deneen was talking about, which is they've been, obviously there's sort of this hive mind and there's this course of use of power in upper levels of society and they're gonna sort of form our moral vision, right? But then there's this other side of it, which is that the middle class is disappearing. There's not a fair wage. People feel like they're not going to be able to make a home for their family and that they're just going to be sort of like these peons to corporate entities. So I think in addition to hitting the moral message that conservatives are hitting, I think we need to hit the redistribution message really clearly. Um, because there's no reason that we should have this sort of business structures that we do that have enabled the kinds of monopolies that you see in big tech. Even just in terms of natural justice, I don't think that you could dismiss that much the work of a, a laborer um, and, and to have such a big gap between the people on top and the people who are sort of everyday people. So in terms of how do we get out from under the monopoly of big tech, et cetera, I think you get out by having a, um, a coherent redistribution plan. Thanks, actually. Well, um, you know, this discussion is pro uh, um, prompting lots of questions that are coming in. So um, I hope that our panelists and our uh, listeners can spare another five minutes. I mean, we're, we're scheduled to go past set to seven, but if we can give us an extra five minutes and uh, panelists, if we can focus on being as concise as possible, your answers have been brilliant um, uh, to this point. Um, but, you know, um, we can try to get as many in as possible uh, because you all are, are really uh, uh, prompting some, some good questions. Um, um, I think the next question where I want to go is, uh, and this has sort of come up a little bit in um, uh, may maybe some of Patrick's recent comments, some of Ashleen's comments is, um, you know, this questioner says, you know, um, especially with sort of a concern of the hyper commodification um, of the American uh, way of life that uh, that, 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 that we're hitting on in this discussion. Um, is there a possibility here actually for um, the left and the right to unite uh, here, perhaps on, uh, on economics? Uh, you know, Ashley, you've talked about, and, and others have talked about, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party sort of moving towards sort of a multi-ethnic working class coalition. Well, that might be something that transcends beyond the Republican Party or, or opens up uh, the way uh, to sort of a more inclusive sort of coalition. So, so I think this questioner is seeing this. And so I wonder if, um, you know, if there's a, there's a possibility here uh, uh, for this and I, um, and we can certainly circle back to Ashleen and, uh, and Patrick, if you want in on this, but, uh, but Dan, I think you also have been hitting on some of these themes in your own uh, writing. And so, I mean, let's begin with you. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm skeptical of a left-right conjunction on economics, in part because economics is also culture. And one of the major divides that we see now is that uh, in some ways, uh, even things like religion and ethnicity are starting to become less determinative than education level. And it seems to me that um, you know, the sort of placeless economy, the global economy, uh, the kind of um, highly refined financial economy that we have, these things are both creations of and supporters of um, higher education and, and uh, the class of Americans who go through higher education and are formed by it. And here's an example of a formative institution which is very powerful, uh, but is forming people in ways that are sort of um, conducive to creating an elite that is separated from the rest of the country. And I think it's very hard, in fact, for people who go through uh, a modern you know, um, college education, not just because of its you know, sort of progressive social values, but also because of the way economics is taught and the way that you know, questions of citizenship, questions of national borders, all of these things are treated as non-entities in you know, so supposedly scientific economics. Um, I think it inculcates an ethos of disregard for your fellow countrymen. And um, so the class of Americans who go through higher education and who then flourish in this modern economy are going to be um, very difficult to reconnect with the class of Americans you know, of all races and of all religions who do not go through that kind of formative uh, college experience and who are consigned to a very different kind of economy and status. And so even though you may have some number of uh, you know, highly educated conservatives and progressives who uh, come together 
and having a, a discomfort with this uh, splitting of classes that we have generated through higher education, I suspect that you will continue to find uh, very sharp cultural uh, conflicts between those progressives and those conservatives, especially since so many of these economic questions and uh, cultural questions wind up being things that sort of look like they translate into one another. Uh, that's partly true with economic nationalism. It's certainly true with immigration. These are things where um, you know, it's, it's very hard to say that you're simply going to adopt uh, a common economic framework that is going to bring together the left and the right when there are these continuing other uh, difficulties as well. And I think fundamentally, you are going to see a realignment uh, as a result of this educational gap. And it's a realignment, of course, that one sees, you know, even in the even in language itself, right? So the use of, uh, you know, a multitude of genders, the use of a term like Latinx, these are things that, uh, you know, college educated persons, white ones especially, but not just white ones, um, seem very inclined to accept. Whereas I think ordinary or you know, sort of uh, less highly educated uh, members of minority groups and, uh, and white people uh, both have a you know, sort of reflexive rejection of some of these more advanced and perhaps um, you know, sort of post-reality ideas that are coming out of uh, higher education. Um, thanks. Uh, Patrick, why don't we uh, get you in on this uh, and uh, this particular question, and then we have a particular one for Yuval, and then we have a, a one for Ashleen. Uh, I'm, I was so wrapped up listening to Dan, I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries, yeah. <laughs> well, no, so, let's go ahead, I think Dan yeah, the, the question. Terrific. The question is, is yeah. whether uh, there is an opportunity for sort of collaboration yeah. on uh, between the left and right, uh, as per, in particular on economic issues. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just, I, I think I'd just be echoing Dan. Uh, just, I mean, just one example is I think he was alluding to it, but uh, you know, an economic policy uh, that's aimed at especially defending the working class is probably going to have to look at more restrictive immigration policies. Now, this was this was standard um, left or let's say democratic um, policy in the in the middle part of the century. Actually, I can put my camera up, and right behind me there is uh, Father Father Ted Hesburgh, uh, president of the University of Notre Dame. He led a led an immigration, uh, I'm sorry, immigration commission that was appointed by Jimmy Carter in the, in the 1980s. And you can read that report. And then what that report says is that uh, in the name of defending uh, the wages, uh, as well as the sense of lawfulness of, um, uh, especially of the working class, which you know, the Democratic Party was closely aligned with at the time, there need to be forms of restriction, border restrictions on immigration. So Dan's absolutely right. It's these kinds of what seem to be economic policies that are gonna collide with what today are broadly, you know, you could say inextricably economic and cultural worldviews that in, in an elite institution, even like the one that I teach in Father Ted's university, I would say a vast majority of the students today would probably find that argument to be unrecognizable uh, as, a, as a kind of left-wing argument. Left-wing argument today is that you, you know, should be basically a borderless society. So I, 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 I have to agree with Dan that, uh, um, I think that it's, it's it, it, at least it's going to be, it would take a, a, you know, maybe a particular way in which a certain, kind, maybe a remnant of a kind of old left, um, you know, a certain number of maybe Bernie supporters uh, might find their way uh, to, to some kind of agreement, but uh, it's, it, it will be difficult. You've all ver very briefly, and, you know, and this is an assumption that I think a number of the panelists are making in um, uh, the conversation, but it's uh, this questioner sort of quotes you that you referred to an elite culture dominated by the left and, and they wanna know what's the evidence uh, that our elite culture is dominated for the left. So, so very briefly, what would you, what would you give? Uh, yeah, well, sure. That? I mean, it, obviously in some institutions you can just look at very basic measures of this. It, when you ask college professors how they identify themselves politically, those who are right of center in any way have declined over the past generation and a half from, uh, you know, about a quarter of college professors to now in the single digits. And in some of the humanities, those numbers are literally in the single digits, not of percentage, but of individuals. So when you look at these, uh, when you look at these surveys and look at elite schools in particular, and they say there's only three people at Brown who are right of center. And I think, yeah, I know all three of them personally. Um, it's, it's a weird situation to be in, obviously, in the academy. I think there's a bigger story to tell, which is a story of a monoculture that is unusual in American society. I don't know the age of the questioner, but I would just say it is, it is, it is a change, even in my lifetime, 
where it used to be that there were different elites in American life. The people who ran our universities were different culturally, educationally, politically from the people who ran large corporations or the people who ran media companies or the people who uh, were prominent in medicine or law or other places. We had different elites in different parts of our society. Today, we have one elite and its members went to the same set of schools. They were formed in the same set of ways and that set of ways is broadly on the left so that there is not resistance to pushes to the left on issues that are genuinely controversial in the country, profoundly divisive in American society, but are not at all controversial at the elite levels of the American economy, American culture, American academy, American media. There is a single way of thinking about a set of questions that for the American people at large, there is not a single way of thinking about so that we now have an elite in American life in a way that I think we genuinely didn't in even the middle of the 20th century, a very consolidated time in our history. And yet even then we had distinct elites in different parts of our society. Uh, we now have an elite and a non-elite America. And that is very distinct. And I think the elite is just recognizably culturally on the left. Well, thanks. And now we're moving on to the five minute borrowed time that uh, that I requested and that our panelists gratefully um, um, uh, accepted. And uh, this question is, uh, Ashleen, earlier in your remarks, you mentioned the 1619 uh, project. And this questioner wants to know, is there a conservative response to the 1619 project? There needs to be because it's a it's a lacuna that they're responding to. Um, I was having an exchange at a conference with another um, political scientist and they were talking about how we need to be stricter about tying the sort of westernness, white westernness, the declaration and of our early institutions to the, the concept of the nation, the concept of the ethnic. And I said, well, how are any of the students who are not white going to say that they, then we'll buy into that idea of the nation. Why would they want to be attracted to the Declaration of Independence? You just said it wasn't made for them, that it doesn't emerge from anything or describe anything that pertains to them. And I think it's that lacuna that is where 1619 comes in. And that's why they're trying to move the date back because they're trying to say, look, in the uh, black American in particular, we have the person who is committed to American ideals and who struggles uh, throughout different eras to um, obtain you know, the American dream, et cetera, et cetera. And there are problems with 1619. Uh, I think the place that conservatives need to go isn't to go back to defending 1776. Um, I think what they need to do is to read people like Albert Murray, um, who McIntyre says is probably the person that can give us a key to better race relations in America. Uh, Martha Menchaca, I think also does a great job. And the, the, the thing that they point us to is that the idea that the nation is multi-ethnic or as Murray says, mulatto is old. It's not superimposed, it's organic. And so you're not going to have to say to create these new categories or bring in these new people, you already have them. And if that's the case, then this brings us to the working class once more and then I'll wrap up. The key there is labor because one of the things that you see in the story of American race is labor and putting labor into the nation, right? To improve it and to enjoy it. And so this to me is an obvious link of where you can take the movement toward um, having a healthy working class and having a response to 1619. Okay, thanks. Well, we have a couple minutes left of our borrowed time and this panel is on the future of conservatism. And I think in some ways your visions have all uh, come out uh, for what you hope conservatism to be, but let's address this very directly. So if you could all take, you know, just a half a minute or so and, and, and say, what are, What's one central characteristic uh, that you would hope conservatism uh, to be about in 10 years if you, had to, if you had to project what conservatism would be in 10 years, in a decade? Uh, so Dan, let's uh, start with you and uh, we'll work our way around. Well, I don't want to frame this just as a hope, but I think something that Ashleen had um, brought up uh, a few minutes ago 
is of vital importance, which is we do live in a 21st century America. We live in an America in which uh, the traditional roles that uh, particularly the sexes used to have, have changed or have they, they've opened up in many respects. And um, you know, sometimes conservatives do speak as if they imagine a reconsolidation of an older form um, and that's very unlikely to happen. So the question becomes, how can you salvage something of uh, everything that was good about the past with a present and a future that is likely to be very modern and very much um, different in, in its foundational principles from the traditional way of life that conservatives look back upon uh, with uh, a great deal of affection. And that reconciliation of these two very different ideas, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult intellectually, but the challenge before us is really more political than it is theoretical. And while there is a theoretical component to be explored, I think the question of how you simply get a, an arrangement that is acceptable to a large enough number of people to stabilize the country, or at least give the country some sort of um, direction politically, uh, something that can then serve the different classes of the country very well, that's gonna be one of the major challenges. So in other words, there does have to be some space for the entrepreneur, there does have to be some space for the non-traditional person, as well as a reaffirmation of the value of tradition itself. You've all. Well, I, I certainly would echo that. I, I, I think that it is important for us to see, and maybe this is ending where I began, that in some ways the tensions we face are not all new. And yet at the same time, as, as Ashleen's reminded us beautifully, the, it is vital for conservatives to be at home in contemporary America, even as we remind our society what it has forgotten and what it's leaving behind. Not to be afraid of the present, afraid of the future, but to face it with confidence, knowing that what we have to offer is going to be appealing to people who are in search of ways of flourishing. So I think conservatives have to be about what we've always been about, preserving the preconditions for that human flourishing, especially by preserving the institutions of moral formation and working to do that as a coalition that includes people who do emphasize traditionalism and people who do emphasize the rights of the individual fighting against a kind of coercive liberationism that is what the left has become. And you know, I, I think that that coalition makes sense, but that it does have to think about its own priorities in a society where the contemporary problem is not excessively rigid institutions forcing coercion as it was in mid-century America, but a failure of institutions that requires cohesion, that requires solidarity. And that's what we have to show the country how to find. I think we have the tools to do it, but we can't do it in a way that's fearful and in a way that's despairing. We have to do it in a way that's confident about its ability to build the future. Patrick. So um, since this is about hopes, uh, in, in 10 years, we will be in the middle of the second term of President J.D. Vance, former Senator of Ohio. Uh, I see Yuval pain, look, looking pained there. Uh, no, in other words, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's, uh, no in, other, in other words, um, someone whom I think um, understands all of the things uh, that we've been talking about here, even amid our disagreements, I think a lot of agreement, uh, in particular, the need to build a multi-racial, multi-ethnic working class party. So it's going to have to be someone who perhaps um, we're going to need a, a a, a, a new departure for a political class that was formed in a different time with a set of different expectations. So I, I really think the, uh, what, what we have just gone through the last four years was a kind of, you know, the revelation that the old playbook was no longer uh, in application, that a great divide had, had developed between the sort of institutional GOP in Washington, DC and, and where the electorate was. Uh, and um, wh whoever that, whoever those political figures that emerge, I hope it's the kind of people that can uh, competently and articulately begin to shape a, a future of conservatism that speaks, I think, to the many, many of the things that we've spoken here today. The need uh, for a, a fairer economy that may be one also that uh, has to has to be um, you know, allow for the the use of political power to restrain. Uh, the over concentration of economic power uh, that provides the kind of broad based middle class working class benefits uh, that that uh, make it possible for people in a globalized economy that often displaces or is uh, highly destabilizing to, to allow them to live flourishing lives. That's a that's a that's an elite that is not hostile uh, to the kinds of 
um, institutions and ways of life that I think uh, people rely upon uh, without the, the, the benefits and advantages of, uh, of, um, of what today's elite uh, benefits. In other words, where family life, uh, life in a, in, in a nice town, life in a, in a vibrant economic order is no longer just a luxury good, uh, but, is, but is widespread, more widespread than it is today. And this would require something that, uh, it, it, it's, it's odd to say this, but in a weird way, it would require a, a kind of counter revolution because it would require the displacement of the current elite. And exactly the way that uh, several of us have been talking about in the earlier question said, what do you do about this concentration of elites you know, that Yuval was just talking about? And I, I think without a real imposition of a sort of political force and pressure uh, that it's unlikely that uh, those people who run the major institutions in our country today are likely to change their behavior. Now that has the potential of being not a very uh, pacific or easy uh, transition, uh, or at least a kind of uh, political dynamic. Uh, so mine is a very, mine, let, let's just say this, this, the portrait I'm painting is a, is a rather sanguine view of what things might look like in 10 years. I, I think it's likely to be very wrenching because people do not gladly give up power. People do not gladly give up these positions of wealth and status. Um, and they don't gladly change their viewpoints uh, that we've seen so deeply formed, especially elite institutions today. So uh, if that's sanguine, it's not without a sense of, of, of the reality that, that likely we face, which is going to be tumultuous uh, and challenging. Ashleen. There was a lot in the past four years of conservatism that I found absolutely terrifying. Um, but there's also a lot that I find beautiful. And one of the things that I think is beautiful is sort of this recommitment or attempt to articulate a recommitment to the things that make us most human, right? So to the things like our family, like our labor, like our, um, our role in our particular community. And those are the things I think that will grab people's hearts. I just, I hope that they grab them in the right direction and that we can separate sort of the wheat from the chaff in, in where, wherever we are in 10 years on the right. Thanks, Ashley. Well, I, um, in a couple places, I remember sort of, I mean, by two people that aren't really thought of conservatives, but uh, Christopher Lash uh, is one person and actually Cornell West in one of his writings defines hope as uh, the facing of the future um, in light of the past or the best of the past. And in some ways, as I've been thinking about your comments, that kind of definition of maybe democratic hope uh, came to mind to face the future. Uh, sort of in light of the best of the past uh, and thinking about conservatism. Uh, but thank you all just for a wonderful uh, panel and um, for your contributions and very thoughtful, uh, wide ranging uh, discussion. And, um, and thank you, uh, audience, uh, for your just wonderful uh, questions and for your patience and for um, uh, even going past time uh, and, um, and hanging in with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, before you go, uh, the UNC Program for Public Discourse would be grateful um, if you respond to uh, their brief poll uh, for audience members. Um, so if you could, um, if you could do that, uh, rating sort of discussion and then describe your own political ideology, uh, they uh, would be uh, very grateful. Um, so please do that. And with that, I'll wish you all a, a very nice evening.